This week's episode is sponsored by The Soul Hub. The Soul Hub is on a mission to empower you to transform your life. We believe that if you are opened up to new ways of thinking, you can create your own reality. The cold water tubs are an easy and inexpensive way for you to experience the power of cold water therapy. Cold water therapy has changed countless lives. They hope to help you take control of your mental and physical health to connect you with who you truly are. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. The school stuff that I went through was bad. Embarrassment, ridicule, bullying. That was bad. But I can have that. It's kids, kids are kids. Kids can be evil and I can have that. But the home stuff was the stuff that, that scarred me. Um, I'm glad that I went to the hospital and I saw his last breath. And I'm, uh, I managed to say, I don't know if could hear me or anything. They said that obviously I weren't responding or anything. And I managed to say thank you. If you want me to be honest, I could have quit a lot earlier than that. Um, I am um, living in that house. There were a couple of times when I wanted to check out. Suicidal? Yeah. Um, I've never actually told anyone about this, but I found out at 32 that my dad weren't my dad. Ben Maran, today's guest, we've got Dave Caldwell. How are you, Dave? I'm very good, mate, thank you. Pleasure to have you on. Pleasure to be on, yeah. Playing some great fighters, world champions. Got a great story as well, brother. Grew up bullied as well. Parents, alcoholics, tough. Mm. Upbringing, very tough. But to do what you're doing now and succeeding and pushing through, that's the kind of stuff that I love. That's where people find their inspiration. I don't even know if a lot of people know your backstory. But first of all, how are you? I'm very good. You know what? I'm uh, I'm loving life. Uh, Boxing is going well as so much. I'm quite privileged because despite a pandemic, I've managed to get some of my fighters out, picked up some titles, been involved in some big fights and looking at what's in the calendar coming up. We've got some exciting fights ahead. So um, I'm in a good position. Family's, family's healthy. Um, enjoying life, so I'm, I'm that's I'm the happy. main thing. And you're yeah. saying you're 46, you look great for 46. Thank brother. you, cheers. Um, I just it's the moisturizer, <laughs> man. That's what it is. I went and bought some there as well, some Nivea I used <laughs> before I came. I seen you posted, um, Tony Bell, you five years mm. ago, he won the world title. Great guy, Tony's just released a book, so we'll plug that yeah. straight away. I'll leave the link in the description for Tony Bell, you love him to bits. How was that feeling and emotion to be posting that, mate? First of all. I can't believe it's five years. Mm-hmm. I mean, where has that time gone? But what I love about as memories and as as how as minds work is you see a picture and you go right back to that moment. You go right back to that when, you know, there's a little video, a clip where Belly gets Macabre on the ropes and it's like I remember the exact feeling that I had in those seconds and where I just completely lost my shit. And it's just the best feeling and you can relive that and special, man, special. Yeah. But five years, that's that's madness. Time flies, don't yeah. it, brother? That's a yeah. scary thing. Like, it's just trying to enjoy the good moments yeah. and create those memories. I always go back to the start of my guests, where you grew up and how it all began. Okay, well, um, I was uh, I was born in Calcutta in India. Um, my dad was, he was working over there at the time. He was over there for a few years. Um, I came over when I was one, um, and I grew up in a place called Ecclesfield in Sheffield. So I'm a Sheffield boy. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just, from, from junior school, it was fine. But then once, once I got a little bit older, 
um, just after junior school, going into comprehensive school, then things started getting a little bit tougher and um, not not as not as happy days. You getting bullied? Yeah, um, go to school. Back then, it's completely different to now. I mean, a school that's fifteen hundred kids, big old school for those days, especially. Um, and literally, I think in my year there was one other girl that was an Asian girl, and there was a a, a black kid, but he was massive. <laughs> Nobody was himself. messing. Yeah, it was massive. Nobody was messing about him. I remember on the first day he actually had a fight. And he was doing flying kicks and everything. I was like, oh, he's all right. Everybody's, every, nobody's going to touch him. And uh, I kept my head down. And, and um, it was, uh, there wasn't a lot going for me at school because obviously I was tiny. I'm still tiny now. Things haven't changed. Um, at the time, my dad had lost his job. So you're on, you're on dinner tickets. When you have that little purple ticket and you go, it's not, it's not a good look. And um, when, you know, everybody else is wearing the cool, cool clothes and and you're not, there's different things that they can look at to, to pick at you. And then when you're in a minority, you get it. So I was getting it from a few different, different angles. And mm. so throughout comprehensive school, it was very, very tough. It, it was tough. Did that really affect you in school or did, when you went home? Did you tell, ever tell your parents? Um, yeah, but... I was always told, um, just tell teachers, well, that doesn't work. And uh, my parents didn't really do much about that. Um, both my mum and dad were alcoholics. Um, my dad lost his job. I think I think everyone went downhill once my dad lost his job. Middle age, probably about 40, you know, when he lost his job, he'd been at a company. This, this is one of the things why I'm so driven in making sure that I'm in control of my own des destiny. I remember my dad worked for 25 years for a company and he got made redundant because the people above him couldn't do the job properly. And out of no fault of his own, going around the world, he, he was a drafts engineer at first, uh, you know, worked, worked in, he ended up getting another job in paper mills. But when he was when he was um, working with his company for 25 years, he, he I wouldn't see him for six months. He'd go to Argentina for six months. I ended up living in France for six months when I was a kid, when I was in last year of junior school, I think it was, um, because he, he was had a contract over there. He did everything for the company, and he was good at his job. And then at the end of the, the term in France, I think it was, that's when he lost his job. Um, and um, it devastated him. And I think that... I wasn't aware, but I think that's when when you know he started probably going going on to the drink. Uh, when did we aware that they were both heavy drinkers? What age? Um, it's it's a funny one because you don't actually at that age. Don't forget, kids at that age then were a lot younger than what they are now. I mean, my my ten year old so clued up; he understands about everything that's going off. But back then, kids were kids. And so I wasn't really aware of it. And I knew that when I I'd, I'd, would go to Asda and I'd want to, I'd want to, I always remember there's a little SO truck that I wanted. Uh, it was only about this big and it was for like one ninety nine. And I'd ask, can I, can I have this toy? And my mum would be like, no, you'll have to wait until Christmas, see what Father Christmas brings you. But then you go to the checkout and I remember there'd be a row uh, in the trolley, there'd be a row of um, Scott, uh, Bell Scotch whiskey, a row of teacher Scotch whiskey, and then Gordon's gin. And I knew that's alcohol. And I remember being a little bit, you can afford all this drink, but I can't afford one ninety nine for a for a toy. Um so that was when I was young, but I didn't realise the extent until my mum went back to India and I was I'll have been fourteen then. And my mum went back to India and um uh I remember my dad just never got out of bed. And I, at first I thought he was ill. And um, my mum had said before uh, she went, make sure you look after your dad. So I think you're kind of like, oh, look after each other. That's, that's all you think it is. But um, my dad would just stay in bed all day. And I'd go to school, come back, still in bed. Um, just look after yourself living in a house on your own basically your dad's in bed all the time and then um i remember one day 
I don't know what I was doing. I don't know if I was playing with a toy or something. I don't know. But I, it ended up where I, I, I see under the bed. And under the bed is just bottles and bottles of empty whiskey bottles. And um, that's when I thought, oh, there's, there's something wrong here. And then I remember when my mum got back um, and she... She basically found everything. They, like, they were in cupboards. There was like empty bottles in the cupboards. They had a they had a wardrobes. There was empty bottles and wardrobes. So he'd just basically been staying in his bedroom drinking and just just stashing the empty bottles. Didn't even get rid of them. Um, but uh, she just blamed me. She yeah. She just uh, I'll never forget. She just absolutely um, tore into me, blaming me, saying it was my fault. I should have looked after my dad and. Um, that's when I realized what, what drink, like the, the, the problems that drink really causes. And, and that that's the reason for, for behaviors. And that's the reason, cause I didn't know, I, I, you know, I, that, like I said, at 14 back then I was a kid, kid, you know, not like now. Was your mom and dad fighting a lot? Do you know what? My dad was ruled and again, this is something that I always looked at. My dad, going back to when he was working, my dad, I always remember he'd work. He was a big man, um, not like me. <laughs> and and um, he'd come in from work and he'd come into the living room. He had his, you know, your dad's always got a certain chair. I've got a certain chair. Everybody's got the chair. And he'd come in and he'd just flop into his chair, shattered and make that sigh. And the minute he'd landed on and his back hits it, my mum would be in the kitchen and he'd hear this, Tony, come here. And so he'd go, oh. and he'd look, look at me, he'd go, here we go. And then he'd get up and go into the kitchen. She'd want him running about, doing this, doing that, make your sandwiches, blah, blah, blah. Whatever. And um, I was just think, oh, he's not got much of a life. You know, I, I, he didn't have a great life. Um, but he was ruled by her. So whenever my mum kicked off, he would never talk back it, it, she she was she was the dominant one and it was definitely under the thumb but not in a in a comedic jolly sort of way it wasn't it wasn't a nice sort of way did you get the blame for a lot of things yeah i got blamed for everything um um uh, my mum so my dad although my dad was an alcoholic um he uh just thinking actually i remember the first time that he i remember he, it's probably when I was younger, he was working in Argentina. He had a car crash in Argentina. And, and again, back then, I don't understand what it is, but he got done for drink driving. He crashed when he was, when he was drunk, but you don't know what that's about. Do you know what I mean? Um, back then. Um, but, uh, he was an alcoholic and, but he was a placid alcoholic. He was a nice geezer. Do you know what I mean? He was just a nice fella. He just didn't speak much. We didn't have a relationship where we'd talk. But my mum was, an alcoholic that denied she was an alcoholic. So she top up the whiskeys, but claim as though she's not had a drink. Um, and then when she was drunk, then she was, um, she was nasty. She Take was, her anger out in you. Yeah, yeah. I don't even know if it was anger. I don't know. It, it's hard to explain what, what triggers it because it'd be nothing, you know, even from being a little kid, you went, went, you, you can't do a lot wrong. You know, if I was a minute late from being out playing, I'd go out, come in, I'd do my paper rounds, then I'd go take the dog for a walk uh, and I'd go and play football with, with with the kids in the park. Back then, parks were full. Not like they are now. The parks were full. There'd be football pitches and there'd be loads playing on all the football pitches. It were packed. And I love football. And I'd, so I'd, I'd play football. Or failing that, I'd be on my own with a ball and my dog. If I was one minute late, I remember run, you used to run back when you realised what time it was. You're running back, panicking. One minute late, I'd get battered. Not a slap, not just like, say, oh, make sure you're on time tomorrow. I'd get battered. And that's not, that's nothing really bad. That's nothing really major. But that's the kind of thing that it would be. Um, I'd be, I'd be, I'd come in from a, uh, from a paper round soaked because it had been raining. I'd sit next to a fire. And because her chair would be behind where, the, where I'd be sat on the floor, she'd like literally kick you out of the way, things like that. Um, 
but that that'd be at any time of the day so that whether that was drink or just how she was I, I, I don't know I don't I, I'm not sure how does that, that affect you going through your like hitting 17 18 did that play a massive part I left home at 15 where did you go Um, I, uh, I ended up basically I ended up just bunking up with somebody a friend um, and then I ended up at my grand's my grand was the only person my grand is my dad's mom. my dad's English my mom's Indian um, my grand is the only person that um, that's ever backed me or um, been positive towards what I want to do in my life. Um, she's the only one that um, that believed in me, really. Um, so yeah, uh, I left and I went. I went. Uh, I stayed at my grand's after a while, and um, my mum just resented me even more. So every time I've gone down to kind of like visit my dad because I love my dad and I wanted to see him um, she would throw a cup at me hit me do something and and so I'd just end up I don't need at this point because you don't live there you don't need to take that shit you can take yourself out of that house anytime and that's what I would do I'd be like I'd try and stay because I'd want to communicate with my dad but then I'd be like I don't need this shit and I'd just and I'd gone that's it and, and just that's what just kept happening Um like I said, even even when I was in the house, um, there wasn't there wasn't any real communication with my dad. I wanted to. As a kid, you wanna you wanna talk to your dad. I'd, you'd come in from work and you'd you'd ask him how his day was. Yep, all right. How's it? I'm like oh, and you ask him another question, and it'd be like a one word answer, and it'd just a grunt. That was it. Um, so. It's weird because you'd, you'd think, well, what, what are you still trying to talk to him for if you don't talk? It's like if you you would take the dog for a walk and I'd take my football and his idea of a kickabout would be kick the ball as hard as he can so I'd run and fetch it, bring it back, give it him and kick the ball. It's basically like a dog when you throw a stick. So there was no, you know, he wasn't he wasn't active. He wasn't, there wasn't anything Um but it was my dad, so I just wanted that. I love wanted, and affection. Yeah, I wanted something. Yeah, that's I mean? a difficult thing when you love someone so much, no matter how much they treat you or mm. how you hate them, you just kind of want them to change. You mm. just kind of want them to tell you that they're proud. You just want them to tell you that you're okay. That's that's the funny thing is 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 with my mum, um, still to this day, There's a there is a part of you that that kind of like wants to not show off, but show to your mum that, because my dad died, um, but there is a part of you that kind of like wants to say, oh, I've done this. Look, my kids are doing this, but nah, it's not there. Did you ever ask them the questions when you got older, why? My mum's just complete the denial. And denial of everything. My mum's complete denial. She's, like her upbringing, how was your mum's upbringing? She never spoke anything ill about her, her, her parents or anything. Um, I don't I don't get it I, I, I genuinely don't get it because I do it. it was it was the school the school stuff that I went through was bad embarrassment ridicule bullying that was bad but I can have that it's kids kids are kids kids can be evil and I, I can have that but the home stuff was the stuff that that scarred me going forward and and I never it's still listen it affects me today I don't believe that I'm totally over it because still as a grown man think I can watch something on telly and it'll just and I'll just think oh wow and it just takes you back to how you are and um you know you hear other people's stories and it takes you and you get emotional about it so um it, it doesn't ever leave you but um I can't, I, I, it's hard because there isn't that conversation there where if somebody doesn't accept what the, how they've been, then you can't ask questions, you can't get answers. I don't understand how my mother trapped me because I'm a dad. So I know how that, how we, how we kids look at you. Um, how we kids want, want to feel. Um, and I just don't get how any parent can do that. I don't, 
and I don't buy the bullshit when people say, you know, you just asked me about her her, her upbringing. Mm-hmm. I don't buy that bullshit. Sorry, I, people can people can give it as a reason, and, and you know, you see on news or sort of court reports and stuff, and it comes out. It says, oh yeah, there was abused as a child, as a child, or this, and they that's what they're doing. The fuck, no, you know how that feels. If your parent beat the shit out of you, if your parent made you feel as though you have you're worthless and you've got no confidence whatsoever, and you're not you don't deserve anything telling you that you're a mistake you shouldn't be on this planet if your parents making you feel like that when you have a kid you know how that feels how can then you follow that on to the kid that you've brought into into this world i don't buy that i think that should drive you more to make that kid feel special loved like as though they can achieve anything in the, in the world, anything that they want to achieve, they can achieve it. You you should build them up so much more because you know how that feels, and that's how I live my life. That's so. Although it was shit, and although it was it was terrifying, I'm not gonna lie. I I, I was terrified of my mom. I wouldn't change a thing because I'm the. I, I couldn't be a better dad than what I am to my two kids. And I owe all that to what I went through because I didn't, nobody taught me how to be a dad. No, nobody taught me how to be a parent. I didn't have that. So I've, I've learned by what not to do. Because your dad ended up getting cancer as well and yeah. your mum, but you found out your dad got cancer. Was it your daughter's birthday? <laughs> yeah, I was driving. Was that being, in, was that being that evil? Was she it just was just, nah, she was just they, they knew for a couple of months. And I remember we was driving, me, my wife, my daughter, and we were driving to take for a day out because it was her birthday. I can't remember, a zoo or something. And um, my mum rang me. And I was like, what? When I, if the phone goes and it's mum, it's like, what? Eh? What's going on here? And um, she rang me and she told me that my dad had got cancer. And... It just, she knew what day it was. She knew my daughter's birthday. And I thought they just found out. I literally thought they just got back, you know, from, from hospital and found out. And, and then in conversation, she, like, she said, oh, we didn't, we didn't want to tell you, you know, we kept, we kept it um, to ourselves, this, this, this. I was like, well, well when did you know? Oh, a couple of months ago. I was like, what the fuck? And that, and that, again, that just, it just goes back to when I was a kid. She would always, every single, I've just, because of lockdown, I've just had my first ever Christmas dinner at home because I've always refused to have Christmas dinner at home because every single Christmas, my mum would spoil Christmas dinner. Every single Christmas. I haven't got a good memory of Christmas there at home. Not at all. Because she would get a drink then just start kicking off, kicking off at my dad, kicking off at me, bashing me it just ruined christmas dinner so always as an adult as soon as i left home and as soon as soon as i got my own place i've never had christmas dinner at home because that's her mentality if you've got something your birthday or your christmas or like my daughter's birthday then she that's why i know she's done it on purpose she's known for two years two months a couple of months she's chosen my daughter's birthday to ring me and let me know that my dad's got cancer and it's like why would you even do that because it's not Forget about spoiling, like, my day sort of thing, but you're spoiling your granddaughter's day. How's the relationship with your mum and her granddaughter? Um, there isn't really one, to be honest. Um, when my mum got cancer, she had she had breast cancer. How's um, that feeling for you? Oh, mate. Oh, do you know what? To this day... There's anger, frustration, and like you sometimes you always think like uh, you're too hard on her as well, even though all this shit you go through. But part of us are soft as fuck that you might think, I would like, what goes through your mind there? I cannot believe how I reacted. I remember that day when she rang me up and she told me, so my dad's died by now and um, for a while. And um, she rings me up. I'm, I'm in my bedroom and... So I'm like, oh, what's she gonna right? My heart sinks whenever my mum rings. Cause it's just stress. It's just it's just not nice. Fear. Yeah. And then so I remember I'm looking out my bedroom window 
And then bear in mind, I don't like my mum. I don't like my mum. I don't like because the way she treated me. I don't like how how she tried to. Um, whenever I took my daughter to to see her, I tried. I tried because of Lou, my wife. I tried to make sure they've got a relationship with the grandkids. So whenever, but whenever I've took them over, she'd always try and ridicule me in front of my kids. I'm like, my my wife is just bite your tongue, bite your tongue, and I try. But I mean, there were once when when she she kicked off and. I was like, right, I'm going. And my daughter's young at this point. She might be three. Young, young. And um, I'm like, I'm right, come on, we're going. I'm like, and she tried grabbing my daughter and stopping me from, stopping my daughter from leaving house with me. I'm like, well, what are you doing? You can't, eh? She's, she was that, she's that kind of person. But when I got this phone call, when she told me, oh my God, I started bawling. I just sobbed. And I mean, to a point where I can't speak on phone, um, both my daughter and my, my wife came running into the bedroom because like, they were upstairs. And oh, what's the matter? What's the matter? And I just get phone to my wife. And and after, after I was like, how was that? I, I can't understand why I was so emotional when I... As far as I'm concerned, I don't like her. I don't want her in my life. But yeah, I fell to pieces, like like literally fell to pieces. And I've it was the weirdest feeling. I still still to this day, I'm just reliving it. I just can't I can't believe my reaction to it. Because it's, if your mum phoned you just now and apologised for everything you've done, you'd probably break down and cry because that's probably what you've always ever wanted to say. Seeing you on the TV, I'm proud of you for training world title, world champion fighters, or you just want that. You never, like, we always say we never want it, oh, you're doing well, but some part of you just wants that person who you love or want just to say, I'm proud of you. That fucking moment, those words can change your life forever. I've never had that. And that hurts you? Hmm. Yeah. When did your dad pass? Um, it's years ago now, probably about 10, probably about 10 years now. So how did the relationship with your dad end up when um, he got cancer? I'd go and visit him in hospital, and yeah, I've I've I made I made a point of going to see because he beat it first time, and then the second time I knew we weren't going to beat it because my dad weren't a fighter. My dad was just a, you know, he was just a big soft, big soft lump. Lovely, lovely fella, really, really nice fella. Um, but I just knew that the second time we got it, I knew we weren't going to beat it. Um, smoke forty six day drinks loads and loads and loads, eats loads and loads. And he was one of them that was just like, yeah, still didn't pack up smoking when he got cancer first time and beat it. And it was kind of like when it came second time, I saw it, he weren't even fighting. He weren't, he weren't fighting it. Happy to go. And, um, yeah, he was happy to go. And um, yeah. Um, I'm glad that I went to the hospital and I saw his last breath. And I'm, uh, I managed to say, I don't know if you could hear me or anything. They said that obviously I weren't responding or anything. And I managed to say thank you. Because he brought me over here. I've got a wicked life. I could have been some street kid in India. And um he didn't have to. Um I've never actually told anybody this, but I found out at thirty two that my dad weren't my dad. So the fact that he brought me over here at thirty two uh, I found out at 32 and it it blew my head but that's why it was kind of like my dad's six foot four <laughs> <laughs> but we had the same it's weird we had the same eyes got the same nose and um, so it kind of like it, 
but the height thing and how he didn't speak, we didn't have any sort of personality traits. I'm the first person in my family to be sporty or anything like that. Um, so I always like wondered. I even asked my gran, and my gran even asked my dad. But my gran told me that my grandma and granddad told me that they found out about me. To my gran, <laughs> it's a great story. My granddad was in the bath, and my gran had got post. She'd open up this letter because obviously he's in India, and out drops this photo, and it's a photo of me. And note just says, meet your grandson. And so they, my gran was steaming because my dad had not told her about me. And I'm one years old now at this point. And so she's gone to the bath. My, dad, my granddad's in the bath and she's, she's giving him a photo. <laughs> yeah, meet your grandson, steaming. And my granddad just took one look at it. Yorkshire, old, old Yorkshire man. He just looked at him and, Ah, good on him. That was it. I thought that was his, that was what his response yeah. to my grandma was. And my grand, she she was like, my granddad died when I was five, but I've got memories of my granddad taking me playing like golf and things like that in in the park. And my granddad took me to to um, Old Trafford when I was a kid. Like, well, I've, he died when I was five, so he took me to Old Trafford, and that's why I'm a Man United fan because my my granddad took me to Old Trafford, bought me the bag bought me a satchel, bought me a scarf, bought me a pencil case. That's why I'm a Man United fan. Um, but, yeah, uh, when I found out that my dad weren't my dad, it blew my head. Because nobody knew. My gran, my gran didn't know. My, my gran still, she well, she went to a grave thinking that I'm my dad's. And... Um, I remember how I reacted and I I'd went round to see him because my mum's it's a long complicated shit. My mum's got a daughter from a previous marriage. I thought she was my full daughter. I found out when I was fifteen when I was fourteen when I went for an operation on my nose and the doctor says to me I'm with my dad, my doctor says any other siblings and my dad just spews out this in the doctors at the hospital. Um, <laughs> yeah, my wife's got a daughter from a previous mar marriage. I'm like, what the fuck? That's the first I knew about it. And I was steaming. I was like, what? Because it's just, oh, you won't believe my family, it's fucked. They brought me over when I was one, but left me left my sister in India when she was 16. Same dad? No, she's, so she's, mm -hmm. she's from a different dad. <laughs> Same mom, different dad. But it's like, why have you left her and just brought me? And it's just, so me and my sister don't get on because I've seen her three times in his in his life and she's a bit like my mum where she wants to control you. She she did well for herself marrying uh, a doctor, the on a uh, hospital in America and she was like, Oh pack up boxing and I'll I'll give you whatever you want. You can set up your own car business, whatever. It's when we were younger. I was like, no, I want to do it myself. And so we don't really get on. But I found that out at the doctor's. And then when she came over on a visit, she said something in the back, back of her taxi, a bit snidey, a bit, a bit something about my parents, about my dad. Because she was, obviously, and I get it, she resented how, they came over here, left her over there at boarding school and, and brought me over. And I'm not even like my dad's dad, uh, my dad's kid. Um, so uh, I then thought, I've got, to, I've got to ask my dad. So I went round to my mum and dad's house. My mum was upstairs. My dad um, was in the garden. And I just said to him, I said, can we have a chat? I went, ah. <laughs> And he's lent on this, um, we got a fence, garden fence, he's lent. And he's puffing on his cigarette. Big man leaning over the fence. I said, I'm going to ask you something here. I said, I want truth. He went, go on. And are you nervous asking this? You're asking your dad, yeah. do you know what I mean? Yeah, dad, asking yeah. your dad, are you my dad? I mean, that's got the most hurtful thing you could ask somebody. And I said to him, I said, are you my dad? 
oh my god it takes this you know this long drag on fag you <laughs> fucking massive drag on his fag and I just looked at him and I knew then I went yeah because I was asking a question but I thought it was my dad you, you do you do. Mm-hmm. even though you have oh, these little niggles and but I thought it was my dad and then when he takes his drag the shock that just hit me I was like, you're not here. It went, it blows it out. <sighs> Do you want truth? I was like, fucking hell. I went, yeah. And he went, no, I'm not. I was just gobsmacked. I was absolutely gobsmacked. And, and I just said to him then, I goes, it was the first thing I said to him. I said, you know what? I said, fair play to you. I said, I love you. I said, you're my dad. I said, you always be my dad. I said, but if I'm not yours, I said, you've brought me over here. I said, you've given me a right life. I said, I've got a right life. Because I've, you know, I'm, 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 a, I'm a dad. I've got my own place. I've, everything that I've got here, everything that I've got in my life, I wouldn't have had, if I'd have been over there, I want to have. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And uh, so, whenever I see anything on TV and it's like it's anything in in, in India, and you, you know, you're not right. You're not Thomas Brothers. Yeah. They did a program, Manx in Mumbai or something mm-hmm. like that. And I just I, I'm watching it and I'm seeing all these little Indians. I'm thinking, fucking hell, that could have been my life. And I'll just have a little laugh and a joke with my daughter and, and my son. I'll say, oh could have been me that here's like, your cousins yeah, you know what I mean stuff, but it could have yeah. been and, mm-hmm. and I laugh about it because I can because my dad brought me over here and I've had a right life yeah I think that's what shows your mentality mate is um, you've used that as fuel yeah. to kick you on now you've travelled the world you've trained the, some of the best fighters on the yeah. planet you've had a phenomenal career you're still training world class fighters like you've fueled that you, like, people that could have made people you become an abusive father yeah. an alcoholic a that's junkie, what, whatever. But that's what I'm saying is that I I don't understand how people can do that. Mm. I I get I get the alcohol stuff. I get that, but again, because I've seen what it's done, I don't drink. Like I'll rarely Billy wins the world title. I got smashed, mm-hmm. right? Rarely, rarely, rarely I'll have a drink. Like literally once I ain't had a drink for about fucking hell four or five years. But about four years. But um, I don't need it. Does but it scare I know you when you drink, though? Does it, you, you get old thoughts of your mum and dad popping in your head? I just know what it can do. So yeah. I'm very wary about it. I, some people can control it. Some people can't. Um, I've got, I have got a, a bit of an addictive sort of personality. So when I was younger, when I was doing paper rounds, um, <laughs> I was a bit addicted to chocolate. It sounds so silly, but I would literally spend like a fiver on chocolate and be walking around eating chocolate, Twixes, Mars, Maltesers, constantly. Your fat kid? And I had that, that, chub. I had that Asian sort of skinny fat body. <laughs> do you know what I mean? No, you know what I mean? You, you, they, mm-hmm. as, as, a, as, a, as a rule, that's a kind of like fit. But that would have been um, your comfort. That would have just been your comfort. Scared to go home, so you just have yeah. your, your little bit of yeah. chocolate beforehand yeah. just to yeah. feel good about yeah. yourself. Yeah, every time you walk into the, every time you turn in to walk into the to a house, you're out of sinks. I, I remember every time, every time stairs went, I'd shit myself. If I'm upstairs in bed, every time the stairs, you hear the stairs creaking, and your mum coming upstairs, you shit yourself thinking, what have I done? Because you, you don't know when next beating is. Um. Yeah. So, why did you get the operation on your nose at fifteen? Um. I. Uh, <laughs> I uh, had a bit of an accident where um. I got my nose. Uh, I got my head pushed into a car wheel. But yeah. No, one of those things. Yes, one of those things. So what age did you start getting into boxing then? Was that I left, it... When I left home, 15. I wanted to box at 10. Was that to defend yourself or yes. was it to get away? Stupidest, stupidest reason. Karate kid. Uh, 
<laughs> karate Kid, learn how to do karate to get the bullets, right? So I, I thought in my head, I'm going to start boxing. I'm going to be able to defend myself and I'm going to go after them one by one and beat them all up. That was my attitude. That's why I started boxing. But I wanted to start boxing when I was 10. My mum wouldn't let me. So um, then towards the end when I was there, uh, I started, I said, I convinced a lot. It's just keep fit. I'm just, just, just to learn how to defend myself. Let me go. And she let me go for a while. I was only there for, I was only still in the house for, for a few months. Um, and she let me go. And, um, but I, I got hooked on it. And I'd said, I'll never fight. I'll never, you know, it's just to keep. And then when I said, I turned around, I said, I want to box. Then all hell broke loose. But then when I left home at 15, I went full time with, with my training and, and trained properly. And that was it. Who was your training back then at 15? Loved it. I was, I'm was. i one of these that I'm a shit at something. I'll work at it and I'll work at it and work at it. That's my mentality. I'm, you know, people can take the piss and whatever you but I've got, I have got a work ethic and I always have done because I want to, not as so much I want to prove people wrong. I want to prove me right. I want to prove I can do it. I'm, 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 I'm a bit stubborn. So how was that being bullied, abused mentally, physically, to be then going into a, your first ever fight? Were you terrified? Terrified. Mate, you think this, right? This is my actual... This is why. This is why I didn't do fuck all as a boxer. Because in the gym, I was pretty good. If you ask anybody that trained with me, I was good. People come in to come and see Naz or Ryan or and they see me on a bag, they're like, who's that? And they're like, sorry, it's only Dev. I can <laughs> but because on fight night, I remember I'd be I lost my first eight amateur fights, right? You're putting gloves on. And all of a sudden I just think, fucking hell, what are you doing? I'd be walking to the ring thinking, Dave, you get smashed to bits at school. What the fuck are you doing? You're going to get hammered. I'd walk to the ring thinking, I'm going to get hammered. I'm going to get hammered. You can't win a fucking fight doing that. You can't. And that's how my mentality was. That's how I remember you lose a fight. Go on to the next one. You lose a fight. Go on to the next one. And it got to a point where I just go to, before I gloved up, I just go to the toilet cubicle. And I'm not religious, but I was in that toilet cubicle because I'd just sit down and just go, Please, God, let me just win this fight. I just want to know what it feels like to win a fight. Just let me win a fight. That's how it'd be. Fucking hell, it's embarrassing. It really is embarrassing. But I'd be in the gym the next day. Get beat, I'm in the gym the next day. All right, let's go again. Let's go again. That's always been my attitude. Mm -hmm. It's always been my attitude. People lose one fight and never go back. You lost yeah. your first day amateur. Yeah. What was it like winning your first fight? Fucking brilliant. What was it? Oh, my God. <laughs> Do you know what? <laughs> it, was, it was local. It was at Sheffield Lane Top. It was our local show, and you got bear in mind there were kids then, there were younger kids then. There was Naz, there was Johnny, there was you know everybody was there. All the stalwarts of the gym, the big names of the gym were there, and um, I remember I smashed the kid. I remember I dropped him. I was like, "What the fuck are you doing down there?" Um, kid from Bradford Police, and I stopped him a minute and a half, and the feeling coming back to the corner it was uh, the amateur coach obviously he's trained by Ingalls but they had, they, they had different amateur coaches and Tony Price did all my corners at amateurs and Tony was one of the boxers Chris Price's dad lovely fella like all amateur coaches most amateur coaches are the face that he had it must have reflected mine because he was so happy for me it was it was brilliant it was buzz what a feeling that was it was brilliant how do you much how much do you think that changed your life for never quit and never giving up that's for anybody watching or listening that you could have quit after yeah. your first defeat third defeat fifth defeat fucking eight defeat you wouldn't be sitting here where you are sitting just now if you want me to be honest i could have quit a lot earlier than that um i am um, Living in that house, there were a couple of times when I wanted to check out. Suicidal? Yeah. Um, I remember I used to sit on the toilet and I would have a, a, I would have a knife on my wrist there and I would sit on the toilet. I would just rub it like this. I just rub it like this and you see the lines, you see the marks. I just rub it and I'd want to press it but half bottled it half thought what if what if you get through this um 
did it a few times. Um, I remember once. <laughs> I um, do you remember? Do you remember Junior Aspirin? Oh, what's that? Right. The, I don't know if they still do them now. The white powder. No, it's a little little tablet, tiny tablets, little tablets, mm -hmm. little aspirins, but they're for kids. And well, we then, used to get askets. So, right. So so, I remember once. Um, I took some Junior Aspirin, and then when I've took some. Like an handful, and I've when I've took some, um, I've shit myself. I've gone downstairs, and my dad sat in his chair, and I've sat outside of him there, and I've just said to him, like I said, "So what? What happens if you take too many um, junior aspirins?" And he said, no, "I don't know." I went, "It's not. It's not a good thing. Why?" I went, no, I said, um, I said, what, what happens? I went, probably get a really bad stomach ache. This is not very strong. You get a really bad stomach ache. I thought, okay. And I shit myself. I thought, fucking hell, this is going to hurt. So I fucking went upstairs and made myself sick. Um, but I did, not the tablets, but I did, I, I put a knife to my, to my wrist quite a few times. It was just too hard. It was just... It was, um, yeah, it was just shit. Um, you go to school and, and people just want to take piss out of you, ridicule you for what you are. You go, you go to school with, sh with shoes, wheels in, with tongs hanging out, fucking trousers half mast, um, wearing the worst clothes, brown trousers, brown shirts, shit like that. And getting ridiculed for that. You, I remember once, like, a kid that you think is your mate, he's your friend, and because the other bullies are telling him to, to hit you, so your mate starts punching you in the face. And when you're walking in between science blocks to go to the next lesson, it's like... But then to go home and not have a, a safe haven, and then to have it worse at home... But, like I said, I can handle the school shit. You can handle that. That's that's nothing. But yeah, the, I'm just terrified of my mum. Just it, you'd, I'd have to scrub the floors from attic with a bowl of water, scrubbing brush, scrub it, scrub it in a circle motion, all the way down the stairs into the bathrooms, bedrooms, down the next set of stairs, kitchen, living room. Then over up, and then you'd have to. I don't have trinkets in my house and all this fucking bits and bats. I won't because the house was full of it, and I had to polish them all the time. weren't allowed to watch kids' TV. If she caught me watching kids' TV, I'd get battered. If it weren't done to her satisfaction, I'd get battered. And it was just a shit life. You think, is this it? Is this what my life is? But I'm always a what if. Yeah. I've, I was always a what if. I was always. What if, when I grow up, I have my own family and people know I am? <laughs> Done it. That was the two things that kept me going. Um, I swear to God, that was the two things that kept me going. And I've got a, I've got a wicked, amazing family and people know I am. Yeah. Now I'm not bothered about people. That's when I was a kid. But... I just laughed at myself because whether people hate me or, or, or like me, no, you are. Mm -hmm. And you don't understand that as a kid that where nobody wants to, nobody wants to put the name to, to I remember the girls would be stood talking to you and as soon as cool kids come, they'd fuck off because they didn't want to see it. People didn't want to be seen talking to you or the cool kids didn't want to be seen talking to you. And that's what I'm saying. That's where the people knowing who you are bit comes in. But the family, having your own family. And I remember I there was a there was the the Christmas before I met my wife, I um I spent it on my own. I had a Christmas Eve, I drew curtains, went upstairs, came downstairs Christmas Day, I had a, a good fella's pepperoni deep pan pizza. Nine inch, not the massive ones. <laughs> um, I had that for my Christmas dinner. I remember saying to myself, 
um, if my life don't get better by my birthday, then I'm doing something. I'm fucking off. I'm leaving country. I'm going somewhere. I'm just start again somewhere. And I had my first date with my wife two days before my birthday, July 4th. How old were you? Um, I'll have been 29. It'll have been 29 I was. Um, How was that for you to get some love, attention, something to believe in you at 29 for the first time probably in your life? I had, well, I had girlfriends and stuff like that, but nobody I could just be me with. From the minute that we had his first date, I could just be me with her. Does she know and, everything and from your past? Yeah, yeah, she does. Um, she knows everything. Um, yeah, she, uh, she's her and my kids are the only people I can just be me with. Just me, and that's it. I don't have to worry about anything, what people are going to say, nothing. I can just be me. And um, that's what it's about. And that's why I genuinely, genuinely couldn't give a fuck what people think of me. Because the only thing that kept me going when I was a kid was what if, when I grow up, I have a nice family, people know I am. I'm not bothered that people know who I am now, but I've got my family. I've got what I wanted. I've got that. I've, I've, I've got what kept me alive. I've got what kept me going. I left home because I thought either I was going to kill my mum or my mum was going to kill me. The, I, the day that I remember, I remember the day that I left home, she beat the shit out of me. I was on my face. She was, she was quite a big woman. I'm small as well, so don't fucking help. But, she had her knees in in between my shoulders. She had she was sat on me, and she was punching me back at head. And I remember I was screaming. And I remember when it was over, I got up. So the living room's here, the kitchen's here, the stairs. So the space at the bottom of the stairs in between the two rooms was where it happened. And I remember I get up, I walk straight to the kitchen, and our kitchen drawer. There's a kitchen window and the sink there. And the kitchen drawer, I put my hand on the kitchen drawer, I opened the kitchen drawer, I put my hand on the biggest knife that was in there. And I remember it was a sunny day and I caught a reflection of myself when I got my hand on the knife. And I remember just looking at myself and I just said, don't, don't. And that was the day that I decided I'm leaving and I left the next day. So when everything started changing, when yeah. you started going to boxing. So when you won your first fight then after nine attempts, how was that feeling for you? Just brilliant. Did you think about your mum and dad at any of those stages? <sighs> I can't remember. Nah. I, I'll be honest with you, I can't remember. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just, do you know what it was? Brendan were proud of me. Brendan Ingle. He was proud of me. He, he was a massive, massive influence of my time well, growing up, you know, he was, Johnny Nelson was, Johnny was a big influence because I saw myself as another Johnny Nelson because he lost fights early on and he was ridiculed early on and things like that. So I kind of saw myself as, as that. I used to follow Johnny in the gym, like dips, pull-ups, press-ups. That's why to this day I'm still, because I've as I've seen him get older, he's always kept in shape. I, he's been my motivation. I look at people like that and... So I've always kept myself in shape because of that reason. But, um, yeah, the, the gym, but it, the boxing gym is my family. Prince Nazim in that gym as well? Yeah, it was, yeah. So how has that been surrounded by those winners, world champions? Brilliant. Prince Nazim, one of the, probably the best on the planet at that time. Brilliant. The entertainment factor, the skill factor, the power, everything. Kid from, where was Prince from? It was from Yemen. From here? Yeah, from Yemen. And yeah. then, then Winker Bank, just, mm -hmm. just 200 yards away from the gym. For what he'd done in America, yeah. he tore that up, yeah. man. And I always remember from the boxing days, my dad used to watch boxing. It was Nigel Benn, yeah. Drew Bank, Prince yeah. Nazim, Collins. That's what I know was proper fights, yeah. wars, just blood everywhere. Yeah. 
it's kind of, I don't it's not changed now, but that's what how I remember boxing. So how yeah. was it for you then, young Unbelievable. kid? Unbelievable. Well, seeing you were losing fights, did they know you were losing fights? Yeah, yeah, but they were so supportive. That gym was was brilliant. But to this day now, there's, there's people like Clifton Mitchell who's still involved in boxing. He's a good trainer, but he owns the security company that do all the TV, all the TV shows and things like that. Um, he was a heavyweight down there. There was we had we had loads. Naz was great. He was dead supportive. He used to let me drive his cars. It gives you that. It gives you that carrot and shows you. Listen, it can be done. This is what you can get. But I was always more no belief in yourself. No, I was always more like, I want to be another John Nelson. Mm -hmm. I want to manage. Do you know what I mean? It well, listen. It didn't happen for me. It doesn't happen for anybody. But it changed the pattern of my life. Boxing changed my life. Mm -hmm. It started giving me some sort of value. It started giving me some sort of self worth. What title did you win in boxing? I won a. I won a central area title. Um, How was that feeling? <laughs> It, it was great. It was good. It was good because I went up to, it was in Scotland. Mm -hmm. uh, no, it was in Blackpool against a Scottish kid, Louis Veach. Um, and I went up and I beat him in his own in his own show. Um, it was great. Um, Would you have 19 fights? Uh, something like that, yeah. Um, but I got to number six in Britain. I boxed some good fighters, boxed some world champions. Um, never got looked after or promoted. I just, I boxed people and I boxed people above my own weight. But, I just never had the confidence. I just so how do you make that transition from being a boxer, pretty average, to then becoming a world class trainer? How does that? How does that work? <laughs> you listen. One thing you can't do is you can't borrow it, you can't steal it, you can't pay for it. Experience. You have to go through shit, and if you go through shit, it adds to you and it builds you and it adds to your knowledge. And you gather that knowledge. And then if you can then put it in to practice and put it in to benefit you, then you can succeed at whatever you're doing. And I've been through a lot. I, I can empathize with people. I can see the doubts in the fighters. I know how to unlock them doubts. And I've been around some good fighters, some great fighters. I've spoke to been around great trainers i remember when i was at atlantic city i got on really well with with barrera's management i was at atlantic city when nas box way mcculloch barrera was boxing on the undercard i think it was um and um i got on really well with with the management uh the maldonados and they allowed me to train on the back while barrera's on the pads and he's been training I'm like just soaking it up you know soaking it up and I just studied boxing. I always studied boxing. And I started off as a house second um, Frank Warren shows, holding the spit bucket, fucking open your like, spat on. <laughs> people like to take piss when people mm -hmm. are trying to like, ridicule you. Oh, you bucket man. Yeah, yeah man. That's how mm -hmm. I started. But I'd listen. I'd just fucking sit there watching, listening to all these top mm -hmm. coaches working with these top fighters. I was doing, I, I did cuts for, for Billy Nelson. I've worked alongside Adam Booth. Um, obviously, you know, being around Brendan for years, um, I've, been, I've, I've been lucky, I've, you know, and then I started off with Journeyman. And when you're working with Journeyman, you're driving up to Scotland, you get back at four, five, five o'clock in the morning for 80 quid, and you're navigating your, your Journeyman against some big shot prospect that's trying to blow his head off, and you can navigate him through those situations. That's part of what you need to do in fights because when you're winning fights, there's going to be points where you start losing fights and can you can you keep them safe? Can you navigate those rough moments? Can you turn it back around? So I've I've done a lot. As a, as a boxer itself, I box, I might not have the best record, but I boxed four, six, eight, ten, twelve 10, 12 rounds. Boxed, I boxed 12 rounds for a title in a foreign country, main event, national anthems, fucking smoke tunnel walking through that shit, packed out the 6,000 uh, basketball arena, bullring arena, I've had all sort of different experiences. I've boxed at MEN Arena, you know. I've boxed in different situations. I've had different situations happen to me in a, in, in a fight. So I can relate to a lot. The only thing that I haven't had really is that I never got cut in a fight. So when a fighter gets cut, mm -hmm. I don't actually know what their th 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 thought yeah. process is, you know. But not necessarily because you've not had a great boxing career it means you're going to be a bad coach look at some of the best managers in the world have been Man. not as great footballers but the management yeah. is two totally different yeah. jobs how did you feel going through the ranks and never quitting that's your mentality don't never quit and keep going to then be on the biggest stages sold out stadiums that's where the, that's where your gold is now for me you're 
gold is the pain and torment you went through the first 15 years of your life mm. the beatings the abuse the racism mm. to never quitting that's where you can connect so everything to do with connection with no matter if it's a fucking boxer or somebody sitting in an office mm. is to find that spark because when you're feeling low for all your life try to commit suicide all the bullshit if you can see how you'll notice when people are down mm. why because you were down for so long so that's where you can change the mentality of a fighter to get them that belief to get them that different see the things differently to get them okay you can't win how did big how did you the relationship with you and big tony bell you start he came down to spar with one of my fighters at the mm -hmm. time at my old gym and um he came down and it was the first time i'd seen him in the flesh and i just thought fucking hell he he's exciting he mm -hmm. wanted to fucking kill you, you how old was he then it was just before he turned pro. I can't remember how old he'll have been. So you've been with him right from the start? No, no, no. I've been friends with him since yeah. the start. But um, I started training him after he got beat by Adonis Stevenson. Um, but he uh, he sparred and then he got out and I says, why, why, why aren't you turning pro? He says, you're a TV fighter. He said, I've, I've tried speaking to... Um, no, he says, yes, I'm signing with somebody. He told me that we were signing with him. And at the time, I was working with Frank Warren. I said, well, why don't you speak with Frank? And he was like, well, he says, I've tried. He says, they've cancelled three meetings. I mean, this, this, this. I was like, just give me a minute. I'll still get your meeting. So I rang them and I spoke to Dean Powell. I said, mate, I said, you've got, it's just been in my gym. I said, I'm telling you now, he's a TV fighter. I said, you need this kid. So they arranged a, a, an interview straight away, a, a meeting straight away. Tony asked me to go with him. So I went down with Tony and his dad. And we, he signed pro, uh, signed signed his first contract with with Warren, and then I just go and watch his fights and stuff like that, um, and just support him. And then um, I ended up promoting one of his fights um, when I was a promoter. It was a fight against Danny McIntosh. The fucker bombed. He he was telling me all along, this is Bellew for you. He was telling me all along, oh, pack it out, we'll pack out arena. This this is but well, okay. Won the purse bid. Okay, let's go. Said to pick phone up to, to Eddie and I said, listen, I said, one purse bids for uh, Bellu McIntosh. Fancy doing it with me? He was like, yeah, all right, yeah, we'll go 50-50. We'll go all right, sound. Fucking hell. It sold about 1,800 tickets for Echo <laughs> Arena. It bombed big time. Lost a packet. But um, it paid that back in, in the future anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> How is that then to keep working with a boxer as well when they're kind of going through the roller coaster of winning, losing... To the end, did you see that he was world champion? Did you always believe in him? Um, or was I started after after he got beat by. He asked me to go with him for to Canada for the you know, Stevenson fight. Um, and again, I wasn't training with like that, but I went with him, and um, I saw the devastation when he got beat. But I saw. Do you know what I saw when he weighed in? And I said this to him. I have said this to him at light heavyweight when he saw me at the weigh in. And he gave me a hug, and I put my arms around him, and, and it was—it reminded me of my dad when he had cancer, and he'd lost all that weight, and it was just mm -hmm. bones. He was horrendous when he made that weight. It was—it was shocking. Now, when he turned pro, I actually said to Bellew, you, "You need to box at cruiserweight." He was like, "No, no, I'm doing—I'm doing light heavyweight." Like, okay, so he did light heavyweight, and and he, he boxed at light heavyweight. But then after the the fight, when he got beat, I remember coming back, the devastation, and how low he was. It, it was awful. It was it was so such an hard journey back that was. But then a few months later, um, he rang me up and he says, um, he says, Can you come up and see me? So I wanna to talk to you. I was like, All right. So again, like I said, we're just we're just mates. Um so I went up and was sat in his, his kitchen and he asked me to uh start coaching him and working with him. And how was that for well, you? I'd Were you excited I'd, or scared? Well, I'd left i I'd I'd won British and European titles with Ryan Rhodes, British titles with Kel Brook. I'd, I'd, but then because I wasn't seeing enough of my kids, I was finishing the gym at half past eight every night. And then at that point, my little boy was a baby. So I wasn't seeing him. My daughter was about six, maybe seven. Um, and I was seeing her for like an hour a night. And I was, I was like, so I walked away from coaching fighters. So at that point, I wasn't coaching. I was just promoting and managing. And I was like, oh, do I want to get back into it? I thought, well, there's just, there's just him, and he's asking for me help. So, all right, we'll we'll do it then. Um, and to be honest, it, 
obviously he's a big personality, isn't it? But yeah. when he walked through the doors, when he when he comes to my gym, he'd do everything that is asked. And I'd never had any shit, nothing. And you know, it, it was a it was a pleasure to work with. It really was. Um, it was a weird sort of relationship because um, it's too old to be my son, so it weren't it weren't that. But it was more like um, it was it was more like a brother mm -hmm. sort of relationship. He, I would look after him in the gym, but he would bring me food because he knows that I'm here and and I won't I won't have time to eat and things like that. So he would bring, you know, he would bring me. Um, because he'd come loaded with his meals for the week, with his food prep. He'd always bring extra, so I've got some. So he'd mm -hmm. bang it in the microwave when he's eating and we'd eat after training, so he make you knows that I've eaten. Mm -hmm. So he looked after me as well. It was, it was How was it when he won the World Title at Goodison? The best feeling ever. The, I, I always... So I am very driven. I am very stubborn. I don't care if you think I'm shit or what. I will keep doing until I until I succeed at what I want to do. And... um. I'd, as a coach, I'd won British Commonwealth European titles, but I wanted to win that world title. And then when he won that world title, that was, and because his family, his kids, his missus, his dad, I loved them all. They're all, they're all family, you know? And so you know what it means to the fighters, you know? When he wins that and Makabu gets sleeped, oh my God, it's the best feeling ever. And that night after, it's just the crowd at Goodison. It was unbelievable. They were just amazing. It was. I remember because my wife was in sat with some of his family in the director's box, and I remember I've gone out of the ring and I'm making my way through the crowd, and I'm climbing up the the stands to get into the director's box to 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 get to my wife and I just bowled my eyes out. We've done it. You know, the best feeling ever. Mm -hmm. Best feeling ever. See, when you're on that high, how much do you think about the past that you went through? Do you kind of go fucking told you or how's that it's emotion not, no, it's in not, that? It's not, about, it's not about told you. It's not about told you. It's, it's yourself. It's your self-worth. It's your, it's, it's kind of justifying Kind of just find everything to yourself. I don't get it. Like I said. But you are good enough. He does, listen, the way that I look at it, I say this to my fighters. Floyd Mayweather is one of the greatest fighters that's ever lived. Muhammad Ali is one of the greatest fighters that's ever lived. These two guys, right at the pinnacle, but you still get people on social media saying, overrated, it weren't all that, it did this, it weren't that, it weren't this. So if people like that, aren't going to satisfy everybody's opinions of how good you are. What chance have we got? Mm -hmm. So why why even bother? What counts is what you think of yourself. What counts is how do you value yourself? Do you know, the, the when when I became, and I say this to, I say this to my kids, I say this to, to, to my friends, I say this to my fighters, I believe the most important thing that you can do is to learn how to become comfortable in your own skin. When you become comfortable in your own skin, you're bulletproof. Literally, what, what people want to say to you makes no difference. That, for me, was my key. And when, 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 we won that, when we won that fight, for me, I'd accomplished everything that I wanted to do as a trainer. I'm not comfortable. I don't, whether, whether somebody, you can't take away my memories. Please, God, that stays. That's one thing that terrifies me. But my memories will always counteract what somebody wants to say. And I've achieved everything I wanted to achieve. How does people's opinions change on you then for being the trainer and then for winning the world title? Do you start getting more respect or does more jealousy come with that? It's both, mate. It's yeah. both. You because know? I seen you arguing with uh, Chris Eubank. Yeah. He was kind of picking on you because of your, yeah. your boxing record. Yeah. Did you feel a part, part of you was getting bullied there or did you feel as if you wanted to prove? No, uh, not bullied, but it's just somebody's opinion but that doesn't hold any value really. Mm -hmm. And and it's like, like I said, is he was he was digging me out, but I weren't even, it was Tom Duran. Yeah, right? it wasn't even your I fate. wasn't even his trainer. Yeah. I was his manager. <laughs> And I'm like, you, number one, you don't make any sense with that. But number two, there are enough examples in sport, in life, that 
suggests that just because you weren't a great footballer, mm-hmm. boxer, tennis coach, whatever, doesn't mean that you can't succeed in the next chapter of your life. What what have you used? What experience have you used from your previous job, from your previous life, your, your experiences? How have you used them? Have you just left it and been bitter about it? Or have you used it and, and used the failures to succeed? Because, you know, it's like I, I try and say to, to, to my son who plays football, we all talk about Ronaldo's free kicks. We all talk about the great goals that these great strikers play, or these tricks that Neymar pulls off or Maradona. But then how many went wrong? But you don't talk about them, but you have to go through them yeah, the process. to get to, mm-hmm. to, get to the, the, the yeah. bits that are success. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's like that in life. It's very rare that that any of these. So I listen to a lot of podcasts of. It's not just boxing, successful people, just just people that are success in whatever walk of life that they, that they do. That's why I'm interested. I want to listen to people like that, that are successful, because I always hear the common thing, is that they failed. I always hear the common thing is that they work hard. They're willing to work harder than anybody else, and I always hear that common thing where they didn't give up. And so at the end of the day, people are always going to pull you down, whether, you, whether you're winning world title fights, whether you're, you're the best fighter in the world, whether you've got loads of uh, uh, winners as a fighter, they're going to pull you down. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't matter. It's your self-worth and it's 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 how you feel in your own skin that yeah. matters. So after the world title fight and then the the David Hay fights, how was they to David Hay fights to them becoming global fights basically like a massive a fight massive. I, I rate David I think he's a great fighter I, I did think he would have been favourite going into that fight but how was your tactics going into that fight well I'd known obviously I worked with, with David at Haymaker for, for a few years and um, is that strange to work with a fighter and then work with another fighter do you feel was. like a bit of a Judas kind of it, thing no it, well it was weird but then does that give Bell you an advantage because you'll know his yeah, tricks yeah but I'll, yeah I'd, I'd seen a lot of sparring. I'd, I'd, I'd kind of like known what his what his mindset was, um, but uh, when it was, <laughs> it was at the first press conference, when he just completely <laughs> started laying into me, I was like, "What the fuck? Where's that come from?" <laughs> I'm just thinking, I'm just training, and everything's gonna be all right, and and he just started tearing strips off me. I was like, "Wow, okay, all right, okay," but it worked out so good because. He like that fight and 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 what how Hay was, he turned it into something massive, you know. Everybody was stopping me on the streets. Everybody he was slagging off Rotherham. He was slagging off me. It was, <laughs> it was like great, okay. Uh-huh. Fine. He does know how to say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was brilliant. And uh-huh. then and then the press conference when he was at Liverpool was just comedy gold. You know, it was it was just he lost his head completely. Is that when he had the but, hair in that? Yeah, yeah. And when it was, I think there's a there's a clip where it was just like he just looked at somebody crowd like y- y- your mum and I was like <laughs> fuck it out. <laughs> but it was just it was brilliant because it got uh-huh. everybody talking. He's he's a great salesman. Mm-hmm. Um, because the second fight was on the boat in Miami and shit, weren't he? Kind no, of. no, it was the first fight. Was that the first the fight? The first fight because he. But but listen. He he wasn't training on a boat in my He hired the fucking boat for the photo shoot yeah. and for the tech sky stuff. Mm-hmm. He was training at the Fifth Street gym in Miami. And they had that boat for a day, for half a day, I think they hired it for. So mm-hmm. again, it was his mind games, games and things like that. It was very good. Look at what, how he was with Klitschko, yeah. you know, with the t-shirts and things like that. Mm-hmm. It, 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 he's clever and, it, and he's, he's a great He's salesman. ruthless in order to the bastard. Very, like, even yeah. when they press conferences, I think they were yeah. throwing cups and punches. Yeah. It, he's, yeah. he's a nasty man. Yeah, yeah, he doesn't got got give that. a fuck. No, he's got that edge to mm-hmm. him. And, and the thing is, I mean, now he's, yeah, listen, he's, he's, he's grown up a lot now and, and, I, I like him now. He's he's, yeah. he's he's a much. He seems to be uh, more calmer. You know, uh, yeah, he seems to be more of a chilled sort of person. How was that though? When the was it the Achilles went? Mm. How do you think? Even though you've got a fucking relationship hell. with him, you liked him, and then you see him, you've got to fucking. Insp- you've got to, do, that do you know what? Not to quit either. Do, do you know what? Is that um, hard for you? The to... worst thing that could happen for Tony was that his Achilles went because <laughs> Tony was boxing towards us at that point. And then he just went caveman style, and it was the old red mist bell you, and 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 it was it was it was terrible for those last six rounds. But I remember when the fight was over, I remember because I I got I got so much respect for Hay for carrying on and for trying and trying and trying. I like that. I like that. And and I remember looking at him despite all 
his shit that he was giving me. I was pissed off before because I don't mind if you're saying stuff about me, but when my daughter's going into school and there's kids on, on computers on Google and stuff like yeah. that, and seeing Bellu, uh, seeing, hey, calling me names and shit like that, it's my daughter, man. Do you know what I mean? It's like she was upset about it. I didn't like that shit. But then when I saw, hey, straight up, we're in the ring, and it, he said to me, he said, well, this is well done. This is brilliant, man. He said, well done. You've done a good job. Um, I just went, cheers. And I'm looking at him. I just thought, I actually feel sorry for you. I did. I felt sorry for him. It, it was it was quite sad. Um, but then we did it again, and that was better. Yeah, Bill, you absolutely scored yeah. on the second one. No, that it, was the training intensity harder? Was it just a, did you just change the tactics? Because Bill, you seemed um, to come out of traps flying. Uh, the f second fight went how it should have been in the first fight that's that's how how you how the the tactics were as such but um that period was the hardest period that i've ever had to deal with as a coach because um tony had lost his his yeah. brother ashley his brother-in-law but it's basically his brother um and from being a massive massive character life the soul it became every day was so hard to work every day was so hard because it was just devastated and um i remember it was just broken it's so, it's so sad it's just there was no conversation it'd come in with train but there'd be no conversation. And it, it was so professional. I, honestly, I got so much respect for him because he trained, he did everything that I asked him to do. But he was heartbroken while I was doing it. It was just it was just so sad. Um, I've never seen a man broken like that before. I don't think I've, in, in my life, I've never... My circle's very, very small. I don't, I'm not around loads of people apart from when you're at shows and things like that. I, I've not been around people that are close to me that have like lost people and being around them, and to see the change in him, it, it was it was awful. It was just it, it was it was just heartbreaking. And every day you it was training. Every day was doing what it was supposed to do. Um, I was traveling up to um, I was traveling up to Liverpool because obviously I didn't want to be away from Rachel and kids. So I was training training fighters that I had to train here and then travelling up to Liverpool and train him um, and I was doing that every day but you'd walk into the gym and no atmosphere obviously no conversation it'd be nothing no conversation it was such a struggle and then the fight got postponed and I'll be honest with you thank fuck the fight got postponed I was so happy because he did everything that I wanted him to it was it was doing it but I don't know what Bellew would have turned up on that night because it had all, it had all come out. Oh my God. It was in a bad way. Um, so it was, it we were so, well, I was so happy that the fight got postponed, even though we'd gone through the training mm. camp and everything. And I felt sorry for him because he'd spent, you know, spent the time going to the gym and, and putting himself mentally through that for a fight that never happened. But ultimately, I knew that was the best thing for us because it gives him more time mm. to, to, to heal as such. Grieve, he can heal, yeah. but more time to grieve. Um, and it did. And then the, the you know, the, the second fight, um, when the second day that we got, um, we managed to, you more know, breathing managed, space. Yeah, managed to get more yeah, breathing that's space. That's the thing. That's why boxing is so important for yeah. people's mental health. Any sort of exercise like that, probably yeah. training, even though the probably saved his life. He could have yeah. spiraled, drink, whatever the fuck yeah. else comes with the madness. And that's yeah. why he's such a great character, yeah. Bill. That's why he's loved. That's why he can yeah. sell out stadiums because he's just one of the lads. Yeah. Still a fucking he's decent just guy. Yeah. He just wants to hustle and show what hard yeah. work can do. And that's what people can relate to. Like, yeah. Just, it's amazing to see like, people pushing through. And even when I had him on the show and he was talking about his brother, you can see the sadness and yeah. you can see the dedication that... He didn't want to quit because he had still had something yeah. to prove. That's a, constantly like even you training fighters now. You probably feel as if you. It's not that you you feel as if you've want something to prove, but you just want to prove do, it to yourself. Yeah, but do you know what it is now? I'll be honest with you. As soon as as soon as Bellew won, as soon as Bellew won that fight, um, won the world title. Like I said, 
is, is if I if I never achieved anything else from a personal point of view, I don't care. Mm-hmm. I've 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 won British, Commonwealth, European, and World titles. But the people that I work with, I know what it means to them. I know what they're putting their lives through. They're putting their lives on hold. Jordan Gill, he's up here. He's got a new well, he's new. He's been married a year now, but his his wife is back home in Peterborough. His family, he's very close to his family, his dad and his mum. It's just the, the, the very, very close people. But he's up here. You know, Lerone, dig up from, from down south, he's up here. These people are, are, are spending the time away from the family and know what it means to their lives. They're giving everything to it. The dieting, the, the, the ridicule on Twitter and social media, things like that. You know what it means to them. It's their dreams. It's their dreams. So... I have to do everything I can to help them achieve those dreams. And that's where, that's where the drive is. That's where, where, you know, that's the selfish side of things has gone where, you know, like I said, it, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter for me because I can. So it's I a whole can, host of different things. It's not just a case of training a fighter. It's also the emotion, yeah, the stress, it's, the anxiety. It's the emotion, mate. It's, it, you know, with Jordan, it was him winning the Commonwealth title that was his big break. Him winning the Commonwealth title was such a massive thing for him because he's a kid that's never had people believe in him outside of his family. You know, never had the big backing, nothing, nothing like that. He's had to earn that, come up through the hard way to come that. And then he's going into a fight where everyone thinks he's going to get knocked out and he goes in there and boxes brilliant, becomes Commonwealth champion. That was massive for him. Now he's fighting for a European title. We're getting closer and closer. Now he's number four in the world. We're getting closer and closer. You know, you you see the what 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 matters to these people that you work with. You know, the families, everything. You know, Curtis Woodhouse winning a British title that was massive. Yeah, <laughs> sure. That was massive. Okay. You know, to mm-hmm. to again the promise the the backstories of these people, the promise that Curtis had made to his his dad, he fulfilled it. So when he achieves that. And you've played that little part of it mm-hmm. in, in helping that to happen. That's that's massive. That's huge. Yeah. How was it going into the Yusik fight? Massive fight, undefeated yeah. fight. I had all the belts. Yeah. What was the game plan going into that? Bellew was winning that fight. Yeah, yeah. Because I knew that if if Bellew was originally straight. Oh. So you're listening to. Uh, I watched the uh, the Usyk against Breeders fight. Where he wins all the belts, he wins. Uh, he wins the WBSS series, um, and the interview. I'm sat watching it with my wife. Bellew's retired at this point. I don't want him to box again. I wanted to retire after the first day of fight, but I understood we had to take the second. But that's it. You're done now, mate. Walk off into sunset. So he's on holiday doing what he's wanting, and um, Usyk calls his name out. <laughs> oh <laughs> fucking hell! I remember I'm sat on this and I just looked at. It, I thought. Oh, Fucking hell, she went, what? I went, we're doing it again. She went, do you think? I went, he's called his name out on TV. There's no way Bellew's not biting. Why'd they call his name out? Because he's a big money, isn't he? He's a big fish. He's a big, he's just cleaned up the division. You know, Mm -hmm. there's there's the one man that was the WBC Mm -hmm. champion. That's the, that's the one, you know? Um, So, so, um, (laughs) when Bellew's, (laughs) He said to me, what do you think? I went, mate. I said, listen, I said, we can do it. I said, but I said, let's do it at heavyweight. He spent two years at heavyweight. He's not boxed, he's not made that division. He's now about 35. I said, do it at heavyweight. I said, you're not being at cruiserweight for a long time now, mate. I said, that, my worry is you're going to run out of gas. Not hold a shot the same as what you've been. I look at how you took those shots off of hay. You're more suited to that weight now. He was like, yeah, but he says, if I'm boxing him, I want to box for all belts. He says, I won't get the respect by pulling Usyk up to heavyweight. I said, yeah, but he wants to go to heavyweight. He said he wants to fight for heavyweight title. Yeah, but I won't get respect. People say that I've, right. He says, and also, he said, if I beat the cunt, he said, I want to fucking take all belts. They were his words. I was right. Okay, I get that. So I knew I've, I've watched Usyk over and over again. And Bellew always, he was the one that pointed out Usyk to me years ago when Usyk was an amateur. He always said to me, there's this kid coming out of Ukraine watch him Usyk he's the one he's going to take over division so I've always watched him kept trying him and obviously he's getting further and further up and um, so I watched him and everybody that goes to him he just makes them look like mugs he just takes them apart completely takes them apart and I was like we got to box this kid I said 
confuse him, make it make it look like he, you know, he, he's fighting a mirror image as such, where he's having to having to draw the counters, um, and having to come forward. I see it's something that he's not going to be as comfortable as as you go into him. So it's like, right, okay, and we drilled it, drilled it, drilled it, drilled it, and he books really well. Unfortunately, it wasn't to be. But I remember on fight week, we sat on the press conference table and I'm sat at this table and you've got every single belt in boxing on the table. And I remember looking at it and I just thought, fucking hell, this is the absolute pinnacle of this sport. We're sat at the absolute pinnacle of the sport. That's massive. The unified of the family. That is huge, yeah, 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 yeah. you know. And I just thought then, I thought, this is huge. This is brilliant. We just got to win the fucking fight mm -hmm. now. And it wasn't to be, weren't, you know, wasn't the ending that we wanted. Mm -hmm. But he put up a great fight. He, he really did. He Do you up think he would have retired if he won all the belts? Oh, yeah. We, we, that was his last fight anyway. Mm -hmm. That was that was the promise. That was the last fight, win or lose. And, and that's why in the dressing rooms, everything, it was a bit more emotional than what it would normally be because he knew it was his last fight. Mm -hmm. you know? How hard is that to see a boxer oh. having to retire? It's hard because you know they've got to adjust. And it's hard because, you know, you forget, you know, for years, I've spent hours in a day, every single day, with Tony mm -hmm. Bellew in this gym for years, you know, and then that's taken away. And mm -hmm. then there's a big void, there's a big hole. You know, that's a, he's, a, he's been a big part of my life. He was, before I even trained him, he was at my wedding. You know, it, it, there's been there's been a long a, a long standing relationship there. You yeah, know? he's a legend. He's, he's yeah, he's not just an ex boxer. He's yeah. a friend, and he, he'll be a friend for. How life. is that? Because you've worked with guys like uh, Chisora, who seems like a big fucking knock. He's a like I look at box. <laughs> I, like, I, I get on with everybody, but I would be wary of him. He yeah, just you, looks an angry I can, bastard. I can mate. imagine you, you have to be wary of him. But do you know what? Again, he's just a big teddy bear. You know, I, I've never people Eddie always Eddie Hearn's terrified of I know, him. Yeah, terrified well, yeah. of him. But um, he um, <laughs> he's just he he's like a big teddy bear, and he's just he's completely different to what you'd expect. He's got this switch. Yes, he's got the switch, but he's actually a nice guy. And do you know what? I I rate him because if you're good around my kids, I've got a lot of time for you. And I remember the first time. Um, my little boy met him. I met. I went to meet him at the hotel that he was staying at, and I was got was on his back way back from football training, and so my little boy was with me. So while I'd gone, I think I'd gone to 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 the bar to get to get a cup of tea or something like that, and and a drink for him. And Chisora just started. To, I'd not even introduced him to 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 my son. And Chisora knew who he was and just started talking to him. And they were talking about football and everything, and, and they were getting on and out like an house on fire straight away. My kids love. Chisora, the you know, they're the very very privileged and, and lucky because, you know, the especially my daughter really looks up to to Bellew because she was around him a lot, and so um, he's always like he's always told is is you know is is like a protective uncle around her, um, but then they call you know they call Chisora Uncle Deza. You know, it, it's it's nice that, that, that uh -huh. they get to you know they get to see people like that for what they are away from the TV yeah. cameras, how they really are. You know, yeah. Because I seen him, he finished it as a Parker fight, and Eddie Hearn was talking, <laughs> and he walked over the White House court, and Eddie looked as if he shit himself. Shit Even himself. at the press yeah. conference, he's shouting, "Yeah, I'm not. I want to be the main event." Yeah. that's the quietest I've yeah. ever seen Eddie Hearn. But like, you can see the fear you don't in Eddie's know. face. You don't know if he's gonna flip. <laughs> how but big I, is he? But he's mad. Do you know what it is? How do you he's, train he's, guys like that as well? It's, on the pads is it not hot your shoulders yeah my shoulders are fucked they are they yeah like, yeah. like, like as in literally, literally. Mm. I, need, I need an up on my elbow because I've got damage to my tendon and my ligaments um, my left shoulder's knackered uh, it's part of the job I mean yeah. I've, I've got problems in my neck with my vertebrae in my neck um, I swam at the chiropractors like two three times a week mm. um, but it's part of the job it's what I choose to do if, if it's too much then then get another job Yeah. but I, I, I choose to do it so it's part of the job but it is very, it's it's very physical, obviously, because you're getting blasted. But Bellew was the one that did all the damage because that was repetitive day in, day out, day in, day out. And then, then I got Pricey smashing pads and, and mm -hmm. with Pricey, I'm having to hold my hands right up here, like literally right at the top. And then with Derek, it's a different kind of 
power because he wasn't at like a one punch knockout power. When when you take him on the pads, it's like really the first time David A was pissing himself because when the first day that I took him on the pads, it's like well I hit it then is is that it? And it was just everything was slow and took, but then as it got on, it was sharper. Um, but with Derek, you don't feel I didn't feel the power as such while I'm taking him on the pads. It's when it gets to about five six o'clock at night. Your body then just feels drained and fucked, and yeah. it's the aches. Zapping that's you. that's how it mm -hmm. that's how it gets to you. Um, but yeah, it's part it's part of the job. Yeah. That's that's what you got to do. Yeah. You know? What about Dylan Wait? Um, How's your relationship with him? Yeah, great. I've always got on with Dillian. Um, do you know what? I I got a lot of time for Dillian because when it's three years ago now, um, my little boy was in uh, three years ago, a couple of weeks actually, about a week ago. Um, my little boy was in hospital with meningitis Actually, sorry and uh, and Dillian was messaging all the time like how is it and even like a couple of months later is he recovering alright is that that again anyone that's, that's got time for my kids I've got time for you do you know what I mean mm -hmm. and and then he he asked me if um, if I could help him out uh, on fight night for for the perfecting fight and um, so I went down on the Thursday. First one or the second? Um, the first one. Um, the upper yeah, cut. The bad one, yeah. yeah. Um, and so I went down on the Thursday um, and spent a bit of time with him and, and just having a laugh with him and his team and whatever and talking. And I watched him train with his coach. Um, and then obviously on fight night, you know, it wasn't the best. But yeah. um, uh, he's a lovely guy and I was devastated for him. I was devastated for it. again. You you know how the story of how long he'd waited for a shot and everything like that, and you know for that to happen, it, it was it was awful. Yeah. But um, yeah, I got really well with Dillian. Who's the best fight you've ever worked with? Tough question. Is it? Yeah, that is a tough question. Because Just nature, hard work, craft. It's it's difficult because everybody's different. It, yeah, but in order for me to to be able to spend my time with you you've got to be willing to work really hard. Mm -hmm. You've got to be dedicated. You've got, you know, and it's, it's like, obviously, Belly's the most successful WBC world champion. Jamie McDonald won world title fights as well with me. Um, but then you go and you say, well, Gav McDonald was so, you know, he improved loads. You know, he was a kid that weren't expected to do anything, you know, and, and he ended up fighting for a world title twice, winning a European title but then I look at the crop that I've got now and I look at the talent that I've got now. Jordan Gill and Opie Price are outstanding. Lerone Richards, outstanding. So it's so difficult to say who's the best. Mm -hmm. Curtis Woodhouse was a grafter. The best mentality probably has to be Bellew. Yeah. Because regardless of anything that was going off, he's going to win. That's his mindset, regardless. Going into a fight with a crack rib, Going into a fight with a dislodged cartilage in his rib, Macabu, hey. Against hey, he had a crack rib. Did he know that? No. He would have been a dirty bastard. He the first shot that hey throws, I think it was the first fight, the first shot that hey throws was the right hand there. I shit myself because I thought, shit, that's it. That's where his, that's where his rib mm. went. I was like, fucking hell. You, you're looking at your man to see if there's a reaction. Belly's an hard bastard. He just, he, That's whatever. That's Scouse mentality. Just, it's all Scousers, man. They're I don't, a different I don't, breed. I don't know what mentality it is, but it, it has some different shit that is. <laughs> you know, that's some different shit. And, yeah. and and like I said, pressure. thing. And also, his mentality as well. He can have a, he can have a row, right? Like, tear up. like, tear, mm -hmm. right there in front of you. Like, rah, go. Him, him and, him and Hay, when they, when they kicked off and the punches were, were swinging. The minute he gets off stage, he's back down, he's, it's back down to normal. Fine. Whereas other people are still let up and like wound up at it. Mm -hmm. He's fine. He's like just just normal. He's he's got a weird mentality, yeah. but it works. It works. Going forward for the future, brother, what's the plans? We've met a couple of your upcoming stars today. Richards, fifteen and oh, mm. great prospect. Mm. What's your plans for the fighters that you've got now? It's exciting times because Lerone has just won the European title. So we're looking at a, uh, a name next, hopefully. Hopefully a, a Rocky Fielding type. Um, but Rocky's had a great career. I don't know if he wants to come back home and fight for a European title. That's the only belt that he's not won, I believe. Um, but that'd be a big fight. Um, if not, maybe a fight in America. But um, he's a fighter. He's only 15 fights in, but he's won British, Commonwealth and European. So the next step is obviously World. Worlds. Um, but you've got to build the, you know, build, build that right. 
Um, Jordan Gill's fighting for a European title next. Jordan is phenomenal. And he's another one that, that I look at and I use as an example. You have a setback. How do you take that setback? Does it crush you or do you become a better fighter because of it? And he's learned so much from his loss and he's come back so much better. The two the, the, the two big fights he's had since his loss. Um, Reese Bellotti, I thought he was going to get banged out. Massive puncher. Put on an exhibition against him, a masterclass against him. And then Juarez in his last fight, tough Mexican, been in a fight a year with, with Anito Donaire, you know, comes forward swinging nonstop, can punch like fuck. And he was he was absolutely brilliant in that fight. So, you know, he, he develops and he's he's come on loads. Um he's genuinely super, super talented. And then I've got a young kid, Hopi Price. I genuinely haven't seen a ceiling on him. He's that good. Got the great temperament, got great family background, unbelievable work ethic. Soaking it up, sparring with big names, good fighters, men bigger than him, stronger than him, and he's adding different facets to his game all the time. He's special. He's special. He's somebody that I I genuinely look at and I think he could do everything. You know, when you're talking about a Josh Taylor, he could do everything. You know, at 21, if he's developed the right way, that's that's how highly I rate him. Do you see that in fighters from a young age that you've got that something special that? I believe boxing's very, very complicated and complex. It's not... You know, people like to say, oh, he don't hit hard enough. He'll get found out. Was Mayweather a massive puncher? No. Yeah, there's plenty of fighters that, that, that aren't massive punchers. Lerone said it the best way in his interview after he won the European title. Um, I think the, the interviewer said, um, I see on social media people are already saying, you know, Maybe he'll he'll get found out at, at world level. Maybe 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 that does happen. But his answer was um, because he said you get found out because you don't, you know you don't punch hard enough. And he just simply said, if I don't punch hard enough, walk through me then. And so far, people aren't finding a way to walk through you. People didn't find a way to walk through Mayweather. Devin Ayne, people are saying, oh, maybe you don't hit hard enough but look at what he's doing. Mm -hmm. You know, there are fighters that aren't the biggest punchers, but are still world champions. Yeah, there's so many different You know, there's, there's, different, yeah. there's the mentality, mm -hmm. there's the experience, there's, there's stability in your life away from the ring. You know, can you take on the instructions? Have you got the right sport network? Do you do your diet right? You know, have you got the right S&C sort of program? Is there too much? Is there too less? You know, there's so many different things. And then on the night... You've got to put it all together and you could just have a bad night. You know, somebody in a normal nine to five has a bad day at work, ah, shit day. Somebody has a bad day at work in a boxing ring, you lose and everybody says you're shit. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, 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 there's so many different yeah. things to it. Is there any fighters you would like to work with? Um, I would not say that. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you know what? I've, I've always said five is my max um, mm -hmm. that I would ever go back to working with. Um, when I had the McDonald twins, um, Fowler and Bellew uh, and Pricey at one point. Oh, Fowler, Bellew and Jordan, I think it was. Those five. That's it. I've only had five at mm -hmm. most. Um, I've got three now. I'm happy with the three. If the right fit comes along, yeah. then it comes along. British boxing seems to be the strongest just now, man. Like, yeah. Obviously, a massive fan of Josh Taylor. Unbelievable. I think Ben's phenomenal as well. Yeah. I, can, I see him unifying a division he, nah, as well. He's, he's got a great attitude. Yeah. Great attitude. Again, I see a lot the, of his dad in the, him. Just oh, earlier, but, mate. Yeah. When, he's, when, he, when he talks, it's mm -hmm. his dad. But the pressure that, that kids like that are under him, Campbell Atten, anybody that's a son... Of, of, a legend, a, of, yeah. of a legend oh my god can you imagine pressure that they're under yeah. every single day mm -hmm. you know there's pressure on them whether they went into boxing or not but the fact that they've chose boxing as well that will tell you about their work ethic because they don't need to do that mm -hmm. Connor Ben I love his attitude I love his work ethic I love how everybody's written him off from day one but he keeps on improving keeps on improving he's improved the last two you know? fights and, 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 but he listens to his coach Tony yeah. Sims is doing a fantastic job on him mm -hmm. and Tony's a great coach a very wise sort of coach and he's taken on board everything that Tony's saying to him. And he's putting the work into it. And he's not listening to the detractors. He's not listening to the backslappers because that's just as important. Mm -hmm. Because people can tell you that you're doing great and that can go to your head and that can fuck the job just as just as much as somebody telling you that you're shit and you're believing that you're shit. Yeah. You know, you, you've got to have that where I I always feel that it's when somebody pays you a compliment, 
it's nice. Thank you very much. But it goes in there and it comes out there. When somebody tells you your shit and slags you off, all right, I'll take a li- You can't ignore it because you're human. It's like when people go on about social media. Oh, you should ignore it. You can't. Mm-hmm. You can't ignore it when somebody abuses you. But it goes in there, but let it out. Yeah. Because if you hold on to it, that's when it does its damage. Mm. You know? You've had what war of words with a troll. You mm. went on Instagram live with mm-hmm. a kid. You actually end up apologizing, kind of shit himself, yeah. which most trolls are shit yeah. bags, to be honest. But how was that feeling for the guy your stature, kind of Instagram uh, live? To be, for a to be fair, I get, I, I, I open up my DMs and I get loads of shit. Mate. <laughs> I get loads so of shit. So do I. Everybody I, yeah, does. Everybody does. Yeah. But, but every now and again, I'll, I might be bored or I've got time on my hands and I'll give it on back. And mm-hmm. a, a lot, the amount, I got a message yesterday off of somebody that had, had, that had a pop at me on Twitter the other, other week and and then fucking, it got turned around on them. They couldn't handle it. They come off Twitter and he sent me a message on, on my Instagram yesterday apologizing and saying he shouldn't have. Fair enough. Yeah, that's okay. Fair enough. Yeah. But he's a grown man got kids it's like <laughs> fucking hell do you know what I mean you can yeah. understand when there's these kids mm-hmm. but when it's grown men yeah. but you know it's, it's human nature you, you, these people feel as though that that they're, they're safe because they're, they're behind, on, the screen. On, on, behind the screen yeah. you know how many times would the people that, that will abuse Anthony Joshua or a Tony Bellew or, or whatever if they saw him in the street would they go up to him and, and tell him oh. what they think of him like that mm. no they won't they might go up and ask for a photo yeah. You know, I've had that. I've had that where people, well, <laughs> where somebody's asking for a photo, as he lean in and yeah. I mean, he's smiling like yeah. that. They said, "Oh, I'll give you some right shit on Twitter." I'm like, and you're in your ear asking for a photo yeah. of me. Mm-hmm. I think that's sad. Yeah, it's sad. It's what sad. do you think looking back in your life, brother? What do I think? Yeah, I'm happy, man. Yeah. Listen, I've made mistakes. I've fucked up. I, I've, I've, I've handled things wrongly. Um. But I've been through a lot. I've learned a lot. And I would never, ever say that I'm good at my job. I would never say I'm any good as a coach. I'm never any good as a manager or a promoter or working on TV. But I've done my best. But I will say that I'm a fucking wicked dad. And that's yeah. that's the one thing that I'm proud of. That that I'm, I'm most proud of that out of anything that I've ever done. Nothing will top that. My 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 whole drive in life is to be around as long as I can for my kids, and to help them in any way that I can, mm-hmm. and that takes precedent over anything. And that's why nothing nothing that anyone wants to say can affect it, because I I'm, I'm in control of that. Mm-hmm. You know how I treat my kids, from what I came from, to how I am. I'm proud of that. Because I do hear these excuses of people are saying, oh, they're just repeating the circle. That's that's what happens to them. But I'm actually proud of myself of of how I've, because I've not been taught, I'm self-taught as a, as a parent, which a lot of them are. I'm not saying the best in the world, but what I'm saying is I'm the best that I could have been. And that's what I'm proud of. Yeah, that's the main thing. Everything mm. else that come into your life becomes a bonus. But mm. looking back in your life of what you've came from, brother, to what you're achieving is phenomenal. A lot of people get inspiration from this. And it's um, only the beginning. No doubt you're still hitting your prime. You've got fucking world-class fighters on there. Yeah, there's, on a, the cars, there's, there's, there's a lot, lot more happening. to come. Yeah. There's, there's a lot more to come. I mean, I'm I'm more comfortable. I was very ashamed of my background. Why? Um, Because it's packed full of failure, because it's it's packed full of ridicule, and it's, it's, it's laying yourself to be shown that you're weak because... That shows strength. But now, as it, again, it may be age, mm-hmm. because... As I'm in a position now where I see over the last couple of years where we see there's a lot more people struggling with mental health, there's a lot more people struggling with life in general. Life's getting more and more complex. Yeah, it's hard though. You know, it's like us as parents, we're the first generation that have got kids on social, social media. media. So we can't get not that I've got parents to, yeah, to really ask for advice, but, but we yeah. we haven't got people to advise mm-hmm. on it. So we're having to deal with that. So that's stressful in yeah. itself. You know, obviously coming out of a pandemic, that's been very, very stressful for for huge amount of people people are so worried about so many things now and it's affecting people's mental health i'm getting so many more messages on my on my instagram on my twitters especially my instagram um so many messages of people that are struggling and so I've, that's why i'm more comfortable in, in letting people know do you know what actually 
it was shit for me and 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 i'm not the the most confident of people i, I wasn't the most confident of sort of people the most successful sort of people i was struggling i what you know i got out my i got out of my overdraft at 40 years old you know that that's People think that, oh, you've cracked it, you this, this, this. Well, I'm not going to apologize for, for our life is now when when it's took such a long, long road. But I'm not ashamed to say that because there are so many pe other people that are in their overdraft in the 30s mm -hmm. and, and going into the 40s. There, there is. It's just how life is. But I'm now in a position where I've got a big following or a bigger following, should I say. But it means that if people are asking for advice and people can draw one thing from them to, to, to not quit on themselves or not give up on the dreams. And so I'll speak about it and, and I'm quite not, I'm not, not proud of it, but I'm quite more at ease about talking about what I went through because yeah. I know it helps. It is helping people because, because I get the messages. Yeah, because it will help you as well. It shows, like I say, strength. It's not, you're not giving it the power anymore that you're afraid of it. Mm. For anybody yeah. that's watching, that's maybe in the struggle, that's maybe going through an abusive relationship, that's maybe scared to walk away from their parents or maybe getting bullied at school. What advice would you give for them, David? Don't don't give up on yourself because I nearly did and it, it can get better. But you have to, there is always a way. You have to, if it means you're leaving, you have to leave. It's hard decisions, hard choices. But there's, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a patron for uh, Nicola, which is the National Association of Children of Alcoholics. Um, there are outlets like that. There are people out there that, that you can get in touch with and you can speak to that can offer you advice and so let you know that you're not alone, let you know that there are other people that have them same sort of thoughts, that are going through them same sort of things. Because I think the biggest the biggest factor a lot of times in, in mental health issues and struggles is that you think that nobody else understands. But there are people that understand. It's just that you have to make that step of speaking, of letting somebody know that it's not all right, that, you know, that behind the smile, there are stresses that are taking over and, and, and taking control of your mind, you know? And I think it's important that, that people do reach out. Yeah. For coming on today, brother, and telling your yeah. story, I thoroughly enjoyed it for Thank what you've done in the past to where you are now. Thank Respect, you, brother, honestly, and I can't Appreciate wait to see you, what you do for the future. God bless Thanks, you, brother. Man. Cheers. Thank you. Check out more of my podcasts on the right and be sure to like, share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.